So what I'm <coughs> going to be focusing on is um, the impact of social communication deficits in, in autism specifically. Now, Joe's already give you, given you a good sort of introduction to the types of deficits that are, are found in people with um, autistic traits uh, in other conditions, but I'm just going to look at it the impact of these deficits, <coughs> particularly on, on autism. Um, the other thing Joe touched on was that there's going to be a, a change in the criteria for autism, probably as from next year, although uh, people are still arguing about it, so it's not absolutely written in stone quite yet. But as I'm sure uh, most people know, autism's diagnosed on the basis of three core domains, abnormal language development, abnormal social development, and restricted and repetitive patterns of behaviour. And that's actually going to change with uh, DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Diagnosis that's used in the States. And we're just going to have, instead of having things like Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, um, atypical autism and so forth, we, uh, the suggestion is there's just going to be one spectrum of disorders called autism spectrum and that the diagnosis will be made on the basis of significant deficits in just two core domains. And one of these, as Joe mentioned, is restricted patterns of behaviour, interests and activities, so repetitive behaviours and so forth. Uh, but the other major category are, is the social and communication deficits that are found in autism. And uh, these are, Niger, no, these are um, to be defined as persistent deficits, so they're not transitory, um, in both social communication and social interaction across a whole range of contexts. So it's not just a kid who has difficulties communicating in school, but across the, uh, the board generally. <coughs> And that these deficits are, these problems are manifest by deficits in, in each of the following domains. So the first one, um, and which is really in many ways the core of autism, is on reciprocity. It's the two-way social-emotional process that goes on between two individuals or more who are having contact with each other. And the um, criteria now make it clear that you can have a whole um, uh, continuum of deficits in this area. So it can be people who approach but do it um, um, in, in, inappropriately, um, can't carry on back and forth conversations, um, to people who just don't initiate or respond to any uh, social interaction at all. Uh, deficits in non-verbal uh, communication, so things like eye gaze, for example, that Joe was talking about, but uh, abnormalities in body language as well, um, and just a lack of appreciation on the part of the person with autism mm. to understand uh, the non-verbal cues that are used by, by other people. And then, uh, so there are people who use eye contact, like the girl we saw before, um, but do it inappropriately or without lacking in synchrony to people who just don't make any eye contact at all and have very sort of flat facial expressions. So it covers the, the spectrum of problems within a particular domain. And then the, the third area of deficit is problems in developing and maintaining relationships uh, that are appropriate to developmental level. Although you do get children, uh, even with autism, who in a relationship with someone they're very close to, like a parent, may seem much less uh, abnormal in their social interactions than they do, than they appear if you were to see them, for example, in a, it, with other children in the playground. So it's contextual um, and developmental, um, that it's within contextual and developmental uh, grounds that you set the problem. And again, a whole range of difficulties from just not being able to adapt your behaviour to the different social contexts and problems, for example, in imaginative play, uh, to people who've got no interest in having contact with other people, uh, no interest in play activities and so forth. 
So they're the new criteria that are proposed. Quite what the impact there's going to be on diagnostic practices and prevalence figures um, for autism just isn't known. I mean, the one group that's particularly upset by these changes are people with Asperger's syndrome because they feel they're going to sort of disappear off the face of the earth or at least disappear off the face of DSM manuals because they, they simply won't be named anymore, although there are moves afoot to try and incorporate at least some of their, uh, uh, their uh, concerns. So what the impact there is going to be, we just don't know. But I think it's very clear what the impact on individuals are, uh, is of having deficits in, uh, in communication and social problems. And one um, particularly important point is that early communication and early social deficits are amongst the strongest predictors, other than just of IQ, of outcome in adult life. So children who have very limited language, who are, very, um, who are much more impaired in their, in their social interactions as children, are least likely to do well as adults. And as well as that, inadequate social and communication skills are often at the root cause of behavioural problems as well. So they're not just important for diagnosis, but also for understanding many of the other problems that children with autism have. So, for example, and I do realise having sat at the back um, for this morning, it is quite difficult to read um, smaller prints such as this. Um, you haven't got um, these slides with you at the moment, but I, I can let Sariba have them so you can have access to them later. But for those who can't see, what I've done in this slide, it's just divided into um, individuals with autism who are much less able in terms of intellectual levels particularly, and then more, um, uh, more able individuals, but how problems in language have uh, an impact across the board. So if you can't speak, um, it can be very frustrating um, in trying to get your message over to other people. And without language, you can only indulge in, in behavioural ways of indicating that you don't like what you're being made to do or eat or who you're with and so forth. Um, so poor communication can have a direct impact on uh, problem types of behaviours. Whereas with more able people, what you see in terms of in, uh, poor expressive language is inappropriate language. So repetitive, stereotyped, echolalic language, um, or just saying the wrong, the wrong things to the wrong people at the wrong time. Um, lack of comprehension, um, again, a great deal of anxiety and distress. Um, if you can't understand what's going on around you amongst people with um, lower intellectual ability, with um, more able people, um, their comprehension, um, even so, is generally um, a long way uh, behind their expressive language skills and the fact that they seem to have a great vocabulary but can't understand you if you say, you know, um, tie your shoelaces or some very simple commands can lead to them being seen, particularly in school situations, for example, as very non-cooperative, uh, difficult children to deal with because they never do anything you say. Uh, they never do anything you say because they really don't understand what it is you, you're getting at. And then, um, as well as uh, affecting spoken language and understanding, deficits in communication also affect um, internal language skills, imagination. And if you haven't got any imagination, uh, you're not going to be able to play by yourself, occupy yourself. Um, so that um, children, particularly of lower intellectual ability, are going to need a lot of adult input just to do anything at all to occupy themselves. Whereas with more able children, they may play, but the play tends to be very repetitive. They have very limited imagination. And uh, internal language also affects self-control. So again, without that, limited self-control as well. So that's just some ways in which deficits in communication have an impact. And similarly, deficits in social understanding, uh, people who 
lack social awareness, social understanding, with very um, more intellectually impaired people. Uh, they may just become very withdrawn from social situations because they're so difficult to cope with, or their behaviours may disrupt, be disruptive or unacceptable, particularly when the social demands are greater. With more able people with <clears throat> autism, the problem often there is they want to make contact with other people, but they don't understand the social cues, they don't understand the social rules. Um, so when they do try and engage, their attempts are often inappropriate and that can lead to social isolation as well. So just to summarise, I think it's very important to realise these, you know, when I started working in the field, uh, behaviours like this, having a temper tantrum, yelling, screaming, jumping up and down, they would be described as inappropriate and challenging behaviours. And actually, you know, some decades ago, a good way of, well, not a good way, but one way of dealing with problems like this was to uh, use things like kettle prods and give kids electric shocks that uh, would stop the behaviour. So very inappropriate ways of dealing with the behaviours. And in fact, the behaviours really not being uh, inappropriate at all. If you can't speak, you can't understand, you hate what's going on around you, this is actually a very appropriate way of dealing and, and a good way of indicating to people that you are not happy. And without the speech, you don't have other ways of indicating that. So I think, you know, one has to, um, to bear in mind that for uh, particularly children who are very impaired in their communication skills. Uh, well, for me, I think it's surprising that you don't get more behaviours like this ra rather than the fact you get them at all. But it is because of the impact of poor communication skills on behaviour that there's been um, a, a rise in, in intervention programmes that are particularly designed to try and improve communication skills. Some of the more recent ones have been focusing very much, not so much on um, the child's communication, it's not trying to get them to echo sounds or point to pictures when you give the name and that sort of thing, but actually to develop communication between parents and children to help parents understand uh, the messages, the nonverbal messages that children are giving out, uh, to try and, uh, in, instead of parents leading the dialogue all the time, to be following the child's nonverbal cues and sort of getting in, um, inside the child's world uh, in this way. And the Hainan More Than Words programme, for example, is a very typical um, example of that type of programme, that type of programme. So it's called More Than Words because the emphasis isn't on words, it's on communication. And it's on two-way communication as well. Um, with parents looking at what the child's interested in and, and sort of commenting on that, um, and, but following the child's lead. So following the child's need, lead is another sort of uh, strap line to, to the programme. So very different in lots of ways to behavioural communication programmes where you're um, prompting the child what he or she should be saying and shaping up uh, words. Um, another programme that's very similar to that was the uh, preschool autism communication trial that was conducted by Jonathan Green and his colleagues. And this was a multi-centre trial in Ma people in Manchester, Newcastle um, and London working together. So we could get a, a big, a sizable group of children, over uh, 150 children, um, <coughs> immediately post-diagnosis. And again, this is focusing on parent-child activities, seeing what the child enjoys, and the mum getting involved in those sorts of activities, but following the child's needs rather than leads rather than the other way round. And what we found in, in that particular programme that was big changes in parent-child interaction, so a lot more um, toing and froing amongst parents and, and child, and parents felt it had an impact on children's language. Actually, um, sort of standardised measures of a, um, autism severity or formal language assessments 
or what the children were doing in school didn't show the same level of changes. But the main focus of the, the intervention, which was on parent-child interaction, um, did show a significant um, improvement. Um, and this just to show that uh, the big effect was on the parents' interaction with the children um, and to some extent on um, children's initiations to the parents, but it didn't have a lot of impact on um, the child doing the, the ADOS, for example, which is a, an observational assessment of autistic behaviours, or the child in school. So the, the impact of the programme really depended on the context in which you were looking at the child. Um, but it did have um, a significant impact on the two-way interaction. But of course, there are also lots of other types of communication programs, um, helping children to uh, understand better, to um, use more words as part of uh, behavioral intervention programs. Um, but there's also quite a lot of um, non-verbal uh, communication programs, things like the picture exchange communication system, for example, which is um, enabling children to communicate, initially often just using single cards or objects to indicate their needs, but building up into more complex um, sets of, of pictures, which can be either just stuck on a board like that or computerised so the child can indicate a wide range of needs as time goes on. Um, and again, uh, studies of PECS shows that it's had some improvements on children's requesting behaviours using the PECS cards and um, the increase of the use of PECS and to some extent, although more limited, speech in the classroom. Uh, but actually it doesn't uh, reduce the child's severity of autism or make their scores on formal language tests uh, improve a great deal. The other um, problem with PECS that was found was that um, it works as long as teachers are using the, um, the PECS type program very consistently. Um, but if they're not give, being given help to, to use the program, their use of it uh, diminishes, and after about three months, you're, you're back to where you were at the beginning. So uh, it's not just the kids who need help to use it, teachers need help to continue using it as well. And in fact, we haven't got much evidence of any programmes that carry on working long after they were first initiated and when the initial sort of input um, is taken away. Um, I think it's also important uh, when thinking about communication programmes, as with um, actually any type of programme, um, that they don't work for everyone. And a lot of research now is focusing much more not on, uh, you know, this programme works better than that one, but which children will respond best to this type of programme than others. And just a word of warning about the Hainan More Than Words programme, for example, um, often seem to be very effective, particularly for um, children who communicate very poorly. But a, a recent study showed actually when you'd got children who were rather more able, um, who, for example, were very interested in the environment around them, a lot of manipulation of toys and so forth, Actually, giving those kids the Hainan program, they did less well than controls who didn't have this special program at all. Whereas kids who weren't interested in their environment, who didn't show this interest in objects, they did very well with the program. But for some, it seemed to be worse than doing nothing. And with PECS, for example, um, the children, that again seemed to work better in children who showed very little joint attention pre-treatment. And one of the things, of course, PECS does is get a two-way interaction going. Um, but we also found that you got more improvement in children whose autism symptoms were less severe and who actually had at least a bit of expressive language prior to treatment. Okay, then, of course, there are all sorts of other nonverbal approaches that we really don't know much about the potential effectiveness, although people are making quite a lot of money out of autism apps at the moment. How well they work, we don't know. 
There's the TEACH programme, which is very widely used, although in fact evaluations of it are rather more limited. Um, and then I think there's lots of, um, sorry, I think something slipped uh, there when pictures have slipped down the screen. Lots of work, you know, in the behavioural literature um, showing that what you need to do is to, first of all, the bits that are missing are assess the purpose of, um, of behaviours like these, which are often to avoid situations, gain things a child wants, get attention and so forth. And then you need to be trying to teach the child equally effective ways to communicate their needs. And then also you need to um, encourage adults around the child to augment their speech uh, by visual cues. Um, and improving other people's communication uh, is essential. That you can, you know, some children will never develop a great deal of speech but you can do a lot to change the speech of the, langu of the language of people around them. So making sure that speech to the child is simple uh, and concise, and that the words um, you say mean what you want them to mean. And just as an example of that, how children can be very misled by what they see or hear, this was a little boy who used to love going um, on escalators in shopping malls. He was quite able, about 10 or 11 years of age, and his parents uh, would let him just go up and down the escalators while they were doing the shopping. He suddenly stopped doing those, developed what seemed to be a real fear of um, escalators. Um, they brought him for cognitive behaviour therapy to get over this particular fear. We couldn't quite understand what the problem was, so you know, somebody went back and looked at the escalators. And what had happened was somebody had put a sign on the bottom saying dogs must be carried, and he didn't have a dog. So he thought it was an instruction, if you went on the escalator, you had to have a dog. If you didn't have a dog, you couldn't go on it. And what really sort of um, uh, bothered him was the fact that all sorts of other people going up and down and they didn't have dogs so they weren't obeying the rules. So it wasn't a phobia, it was just complete misunderstanding. And just, you know, helping people to know what words don't use. And I think, um, you know, one always, can always make mistakes no matter how long you've been in the business of, of what you say to children with autism. But I think words, to forbidden words should be things like perhaps, soon, in a minute, we'll see... If the weather's okay, I'll think about it. All sort of vague terms like that. And it's also absolutely no go to say to the child, don't do that. Unless you tell him what to do, he's quite likely to stop doing that and go and do something even worse. So I think it's bearing in mind how we talk to them as well as how they talk to us that needs to be uh, very carefully appraised. And then... Um, rushing through now, I'm afraid, just looking at social skills interventions. These are clearly needed to improve social understanding and then, of course, social behaviour and, you know, following on from that, social acceptance. So I think, you know, from very early age, we need to be focusing on teaching very basic social rules, not taking your clothes off in public, things like that might be fine <laughs> If you've got a two-year-old who strips down to a knickers because it's a bit hot, that, that's not really a problem. If you've got a 20-year-old who does that, that is a big problem. So it's really instilling very basic rules um, uh, in, in children early on because they don't understand that so other people's views change over time. Um, so it's better to have simple rules straight uh, early on that you can then adapt with time if necessary. So, you know, not approaching strangers, not talking about uh, topics that other people may um, um, find, you know, rather worrying and so forth. And how to approach other people, joining games, basic hygiene and self-care and so forth. So just, you know, some very basic rules there. Um, we need to be um, developing better programmes for ad addressing the fundamental deficits in social understanding and emotional understanding and so forth. But I think there, you know, our knowledge of how to do this is really much more limited. Teaching kids not to take their clothes off in public is one thing, but as, as uh, Joe pointed out, teaching a child how to make eye contact 
is something very different because there aren't any very good rules and rules like look at me when I'm talking to you can misfire as the, the little girl with Joe showed. So just looking at the programmes around, there's a circle of friends to try and help peers uh, support a child with autism. There's social stories, <coughs> which actually do seem to be useful for changing, improving <coughs> behaviour problems, though probably less so social skills. And again, <coughs> they tend to work better with children who are at least of borderline verbal IQ. They work less well with uh, children of very low intellectual levels. <coughs> then there are a whole range of other social uh, strategies, theory of mind type programmes, social skills groups, uh, peer-based programmes, video modelling and so forth. Um, and if you look in the literature, all of these types of programmes will have at least some studies reporting on their effectiveness. But the results are often very situation specific, <clears throat> so they work very well in the nice social skills group you're running, but they, there's no evidence they work in the playground, which is where they really matter. And obviously a lot of these programmes start quite late. You know, typically children in junior school or the early years of secondary school um, and, you know, social skills for other people develop as soon as children are born. Starting at 12 is, is really 12 years too late. Um, and I'm not sure we sort of teach the right sorts of behaviours anyway. Um, and this example I, I use quite a lot because I think it's, it's a very good one. Um, a colleague of mine who, um, she was running, you know, typical social skills group, um, women therapists, group of adolescent lads, and you teach them all the sorts, sorts of things you like as a female therapist, people, how to be polite and nice to each other and that sort of thing. And actually teenage boys aren't nice and they're not polite to each other. Um, and somebody she said she'd taken her group to a football match. She'd been teaching them compliments. And um, you know, she'd taken them to a football match and she heard one of them saying to one, you know, oh, Jonathan, your hair looks very nice. And Jonathan saying, and I like your jacket, Jeremy. Whereas, you know, everybody around is yelling and cursing and swearing and that sort of thing. So, you know, this group of kids who are a bit out of place anyway just look instantly even more out of place. So I think we've got a long way to go there. And I talked a bit about challenging behaviours, but I think it's not that sort of challenge that's the problem. It's the challenge to us of knowing really how uh, really to sort of be able to uh, help children develop the skills they need. And uh, got this quote by Einstein saying, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think we still don't understand the core nature of the social deficits in autism um, and you know we can see that that girl jo, jo showed before was doing the wrong thing in her eye contact but how you make her do the right thing is is a very different uh, issue and i think we also need to focus on uh, because i think we lack so much knowledge about changing um, children's behaviour, focusing more on, on changing other people's behaviour. So it can be much better to focus on, on the people around the child sometimes than the child with autism themselves. And trying to create a more <coughs> autism-friendly environment. And that can be an environment that's quite unconventional in many ways. Um, I had a, um, some teachers who... Um, were questioned by inspectors that came around because they've got a little boy in this class in their class and when he did something um, good to fit in with the classroom they gave him um, a set of about um, 10 long division problems to go and do and the inspectors of course thought this was terrible you know why isn't he allowed to be playing more free time was actually for that child doing long division was just like you know heaven for him and the more difficult it was the better but to other people that sort of reward um, or behavior of the adults can look very unusual and unconventional you clearly need sorry uh, environments that are less verbal and more visual, 
They need to be as concrete as possible in terms of instructions, what you're going to do, um, what the expectations are and so forth. And, you know, whereas in, in normal infant schools you're trying to give kids lots of choice and lots of flexibility, and to some extent one does that a lot in, in um, uh, placements for children with more general learning disabilities as well, choice for some people with autism can just be absolutely, it can send them into a sort of almost catatonic state, just deciding whether they want a cup of orange juice or a cup of water before break can ruin the rest of the day. So choice is very difficult, coping with flexibility is very different, difficult. And so really what they need is environments that are controllable, uh, at least to some extent, and predictable, again, to, to some extent. And if you're going to introduce change, you need to help them <laughs> understand that change is coming. And they need a consistent approach from everyone around. And the more parents and teachers and other professionals can work together to achieve a, a consistent and autism-appropriate environment, uh, the more change one's likely to uh, uh, be able to, um, to get. So thank you. <laughs>